نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضننا ومن يضلل فلا هادينا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد I would like to in the remaining time just continue with the discussion that has been taking place over the last three Jumu'ahs which is on the issue of some of the ill practices customs and practices that we have Wa alaykum salam on the occasion of death in our communities in our families uh, in, in our cultures, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian cultures in particular. And one of those ill practices or customs that we have is the feeding of people by the uh, family of the deceased. And uh, without repeating anything that I've said previously, I would like to just mention a few more things and also what we should really be doing. Now, one problem that we have in our communities and also in our cultures, and when I say cultures, I mean our, our religious, ethnic, geographic cultures that we have. Okay? Obviously, our culture should be the culture of Islam, but as you travel in the world, you will see, and if you live in different parts of the world, then you will see that people's, uh, people's practice of Islam <coughs> is, is different. People differ in their understandings and also their, their, the practice of Islam. Even within Asia, if you live in, I've lived in Bangladesh for a very long time, then I lived in Pakistan for also a very long time. And you can see that although we're exactly the same Muslims, our roots are the same, our legal school is the same, it's the Hanafi school, and also the, the sub school within the school, the Deobandi school that I adhere to, that I've been educated in, is also the same in Pakistan and Bangladesh and India. But you'll see that there are various, some, uh, differences that we have. So <clears throat> when I say culture, that's what I mean. The, the, the culture that is sort of embedded in said that is established within our, <clears throat> within our communities. So feeding of people is something that we have in Asian uh, Muslim cultures and communities by feeding by the family of the deceased. And as I was saying uh, before I finished in the last Jumu'ah, the best form of sadaqa is a sadaqa that is done discreetly, makhfi. <laughs> That is done secretly, without show, without, without name and fame, without any form of ostentation or vanity or pride. But you do it secretly, only you know and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. There's no need to advertise it, there's no need to publicize it. And uh, we are, there are many hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where we are discouraged from doing anything for recognition. And this is why we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith and this applies to any form of ibadah, any form of act of worship that we do, either, either a direct act of worship, like we come for Jumu'ah now, our Salat, our Som, and Zakat, and so, uh, Hajj, and so on. They are direct forms of, of ibadat. Ibadat maqsuda. And also there are ibadat, acts of worship that are indirect. So they're not ritual acts of worship. But they do become acts of worship because of the intention that we have. And a, the intention of a mu'min, of a believer, is better than his actions, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Niyatul mu'mini khairun min amalihi. The niyyah, the intention of a believer, is better than his actual amal, his actual action. So, when we do something which otherwise would look like a, a worldly thing, a mundane daily thing that we do or something that is non-religious, not for our deen, then not an act of worship, but we do it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do it knowing that it is the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is part of our deen, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires me to do this. And it is a sunnah, the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even habitual things, things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did as a matter of habit, habitual things, adat. 
when the intention, the niyat is that I'm doing it because of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it, then that becomes an indirect form of ibadah. For example, in our communities, we, for example, wear a topi, a prayer hat. Now that is not a requirement to be a Muslim. It's not a fard, it's not a wajib. It's, 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 it's not something that is required, that is compulsory in any way. <coughs> we do it because we know the Prophet Wasallam used to wear a topi, a kalansua or a hat, a Muslim cap, hat. <coughs> this kurta that you're wearing, the kameez, shalwar and the kameez that you're wearing, or the, the, the ones, these ones that we're wearing, the, the Arabic kameez. They're the same things, but they've just altered due to the geographic location of the, of the, of the people. So the Arabs wear it in a, in a, in a certain uh, style, the long gowns, kameez, which we call jubba, <coughs> which is incorrect in a way. And <coughs> Asians, when you go, eat, go to Asia, Turkey, and that part of the world, then you see they're wearing what Yamin Chacha is wearing, and the brother here is wearing. <coughs> Why do we wear this? It's not a requirement of our deen. The deen requires us, men and women, to, to, to dress in what is considered by the deen, by Islam, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be modestly dressed. And how, what is modestly dressed? That is defined by the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But why do we wear this? Either all the time, in my case, or sometimes, in most of your cases, we wear it because we know from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that he used to wear this. And, and our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said that the, the most beloved, ahabba, kana ahabba thiyabi la rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam al-qamis. That the, the, the dearest, the, the beloved, the favorite of all clothing to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the qamis. He used to love you wearing the qamis. So now when we practice these which are not direct forms of ibadat, I attire the libas that we wear, but we do it because we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do it. He used to wear, he used to wear clothes in this, in this certain, in this way. He used to wear certain items of clothing. <coughs> then we're doing it because of our love for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which then makes it a form of ibadah. So, whatever form of ibadah that we do, either a direct form of ibadah or an indirect form of ibadah, we should try not to publicize it. There are exceptions, like I mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the last Jumu'ah. <coughs> and that's why the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith called it ash-shirk al-khafi, a discreet form of shirk, associating partners with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. When you do something for recognition, when you do something, something meaning a form of ibadah, an act of worship, <coughs> either a direct form of worship or an indirect form of worship for name and fame. To impress people, not to impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to impress the makhluq, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith gave the definition of this, as shirkul khafi, discrete form of shirk. By saying as shirkul khafi, <coughs> the discrete form of shirk is أَيَّقُومَ الرَّجُلُّ فَيُصَلِّي فَيَزِيدُ مِن صَلَاتِهِ لِمَا يَرَى مِن نَظَرِ رَجُلُ That a man stands up to pray his salah, namaz. And then he, he then increases his salah. Either he increases the ruku' or the sujood, or the quality of his ruku' or the quality of his sujood, or the increases the length of his qaraat, his standing and so on. So he, he makes his salah better. فَيَزِيدُ مِن صَلَاتِهِ he increases his salat, he makes it better, lima yarami nazari rajul, because of what he can, notices, he's conscious that another man is watching him. So he notices, he knows that someone is watching him, so therefore he then, he makes his salat even better. To, to, in other words, to impress that other person. <coughs> to impress the other person who is watching him. Now that is the definition given by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for ashirkul khafi, the discrete form of shirk. So whatever we do, especially in sadaqat, because uh, this discrete form of shirk does not, <coughs> it, it happens very easily in sadaqat. And this is why these practices that we have in our communities, in our countries, when someone's donated five pounds or, you know, dosh to the masjid in my village, then they need to get the imam sahab, the imam of the masjid to make an announcement. That so-and-so or so-and-so's mom has donated 
Now, villages in Bangladesh, someone says, Mom has donated two eggs to the masjid. This happens in our villages. And what happens in our villages? They get the microphone, the loudspeaker system of the masjid, to be, that to be announced over so that all the village people of the village or the nearby villages can, can hear. Now, so and so's mom has donated four eggs, eggs to the masjid. So there's no need for this. So when a person, a loved one dies, when they depart from this dunya, if we, if the reason why we're feeding people is obviously with a good intention, inshallah, is because we want the, our loved one, the person who has passed away, to earn the thawab, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the thawab, the reward of that good deed of feeding, which is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the best form of deed, best form of good deed. It'am al ta'am. The thawab to be granted to the deceased person. So we should do it in a way that is pleasing, most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, so we should do something which is not publicized, which is not, there's no pomp and glory and fanfare accompanying that good deed. So generally, generally, any sadaqat, sadaqat should be given discreetly. There are exceptions that I mentioned previously. Also, when we do any form, when you do a good deed, which is in the form of sadaqa, the best form of sadaqa is the sadaqa that will be anfa'lil fuqara the most beneficial for the destitute, for the poor people. So what sadaqah is most beneficial? Allah Ta'ala has blessed us with aql, with an intellect. We can use your aql and think what will be in the best interest. My dad has passed away, I want to do something for my dad. I want to do a good deed that will benefit my dad in his grave and beyond the grave. So I want to do that which will be the most rewarding. Like we do with our worldly affairs, we want the, the thing that is the most rewarding, the most efficient use of my time and my money. So we need to do that which will be the most rewarding for my dad. So the fuqaha, the jury say, you do that which is anfa'lil fuqara, that which is the most beneficial for the recipient of your sadaqah. So if you now, like I mentioned the man who slaughtered 40 cows, 40, four zero cows, when his young son, teenager son, died in an accident, motorcycle accident in Bangladesh, he slaughtered 40 cows in this shinni to feed all the people of that region. Now that could have been done better. 40 cows is a lot of money, a lot of money. He could have just got that four, the, the money that he wants to spend on buying those 40 cows and all the other expenses of having this huge feast. And then he could have distributed all the money to all the fuqara and the masakin of that entire region. All the poor people of that region. Because people, if you make a big feast, you prepare a big meal, then there's a, because I've lived there for so long, for so many years, there are so many munkarat fighting and so much happens. I think there's more guna, more sin, more ma'asiyah in these events than sawab. And I'm sure those who have lived in Bangladesh and witnessed this in new occasions would testify to this. Yeah. So if you give that money to them, because the fakir, the poor person who comes to eat from your shinni, from this big meal that you, you've organized, <clears throat> yes, he will enjoy it. He'll enjoy it, but then the ne when the next meal time arrives, he has no food for his children because he's, he's a poor person. Whereas if you gave that money to him, then he could then use that money to buy whatever is essential, in his, whatever is, he needs for his children, onions, spices, rice, flour, and so on, then he can use it in the most appropriate and most necessary way. So whenever, and that's why you see in the, in the, on the issue of zakat, the fuqaha state, there are two nisab, there are two quantums of zakat, the gold quantum and the silver quantum. The gold quantum makes it the, the nisab or the money that you need to have or the amount of gold or the price of gold is quite high compared with the silver quantum. Now the silver criteria, <coughs> criterion or quantum is very, very low. It's a very, very little money. So what the fuqaha state, the imams of fiqh of sharia state, is that when you have to look at what is anfa'lil fuqara, what is more beneficial in the best interest of the fuqara, the poor people, which is the quantum of the silver. Then they say, then if you have the silver amount, then you have to give zakat. And I will continue with this point in the next session, inshallah. What should we then do instead? Now, a few weeks ago, I attended a janazah in another town. 
And in that janazah, there were a lot of people. Alhamdulillah, the whole masjid was completely packed. It was a very, it was a main main masjid of that area. It was a very big masjid, very big. And uh, due to the popularity of the the brother who passed away, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant him jannah. He was involved with the tablighi jamaat, and he was very popular in that area, <coughs> that city. So the whole masjid was packed. And then after the janazah, salatul janazah, <coughs> we accompanied the the bear. The, the, the dead body, Lash, <coughs> to the cemetery. And then there I was speaking to a relative of mine. We just stood apart. We also participated in the Tadfin. <coughs> and then <coughs> I was asked by my relative, will you be going for the eating? Because they will be eating afterwards. <coughs> I said, no, I don't eat. <coughs> I don't eat shinni or on these occasions, food prepared by the family of the deceased. And then he, then he was saying, but this is something that you can't avoid. And also all these people who have come from distant towns and cities, you know, they have to do something to, because where will they eat? And I said to him, you know, we know, you know, <coughs> ulama know, that this eating is a munkar. This eating is something which is against the sunnah. I consider it to be against the sunnah, this eating and feeding on this occasion. He said, yes, but it's so much ingrained in our communities, it's so difficult. And also it's difficult for the family of the deceased to not feed the people, all the mehmans, all the guests who have arrived from distant towns and cities. So they, they have to make an arrangement for, the, for their feeding. I said, and then the, the, I said, but there are other things also, there are other things. We were just having a conversation as they were uh, putting the <coughs> soil into the, into the Qabr. And then I said, there are also, I said myself, there are also... <coughs> Other things that will happen now here, which the fuqaha in the books of fiqh state is a bid'ah that will happen. And everyone will join in, to, in those things. And, uh, you know, the khawas, not the awam, not the lay people, the, 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 the common Muslims, but even the khawas, the special people, the people of knowledge and so on. They are also participating in these things all the time. And they know very well that this, the, the fuqaha, the imams of fiqh, the imams of sharia, the imams of the sunnah have stated these are bid'ahat, these are munkarat. <coughs> Their vices, they're against the sunnah, the innovations, condemned. <coughs> he said, but what, what, what can you do? It's so much established in our communities. I said, well, I, I'm not going to do it. Because unless and until we, we confront these things that are either vices or against the sunnah, <coughs> or things which ought to be not done, until we face up to this challenge, these will just continue. So people, someone has to make that move. For decades and decades, those who should be leading us in our deen, they have been saying, yes, we know it's a, it's a munkar, we know it's wrong, we know it's a bid'ah, we know it's against the sunnah. But they always use, in my experience, brother, they always use the F word. What's the F word? Fitna. If you stand up to this and if you condemn this and if you try to eradicate this from our masajid, from our communities, from our cultures, there will be fitna. So we've used the F word, the F card, all these decades. But someone has to stand up to this. And once you explain with Dalil, with Quran and Sunnah, with the Hadith, that this is a munkar, it has nothing to do with our deen, it has nothing to do with our madhab, then inshallah it will, yes, there will, there will be misunderstanding, there may be quarreling and so on, but someone has to make that first move. But so using the F card, the fitna card, is an easy, easy thing for people to do. So we need to, and I said to the brother, I'm going to finish now, I said to the brother <coughs> that I don't do it. I don't need any form of shinni. And if we all boycott this shinni, the feeding of, by the family of the deceased, if everyone, all of us, boycott it, we say to them that, no, when I visit, when I personally visit a family that has been bereaved, I make it clear, I'm coming to your house for your ta'ziyah, for your condolences, to give you condolences, and I will not even drink a sip of tea in your house. And I also explain why. It's not that I have anything against you, I want to practice the sunnah. If everyone does that, and they said, where are you going to be eating? Because I need to come back to North Ampton. I said, there are plenty of chip shops here. So here you see, there are so many chip shops. I'll just go to any shop and have chips. If we all do that, then inshallah, that's the way we can eradicate this. And that's the, that's the, the, the rule, the, the step that everyone, we as a community, Muslims as an ummah, need to take with every form of munkar, every form of evil or vice or thing that is, contradicts the sunnah, contradicts the sharia. Someone needs to make the first move and we all need to make the first moves collectively. When an alim, a sheikh, an imam makes the first move, then often we see he's eliminated. They use the F card, oh, he's a fitna, he caused the fitna. So it, it's easy, if you look at the tyrants of the Middle East in the recent years, I'm not going to name them, we all know who they are, the tyrants and the, tyrants and the despots in the Arab world, 
What did they do when people, when people stood up to their tyranny and their wrongdoing and injustices and oppressions and crimes against humanity? Every single tyrant used the F card. He said, fitna, these people are fitna. And they even said, if they called people to jihad against the people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the understanding of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabu wa sallam Subhanak Allahumma wa hamdik Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk